who's hopping on to join us today. Um, I'm now going to pass it on to our executive director, Megan Miller Gitlin, to introduce herself in the One Meal a Day campaign we're hosting. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Miller Gitlin and the executive director for EATS. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to our incredible partnership with Plant Based Utah and the panelists who are affiliated with that organization as well as we move One Meal a Day forward. Uh, EATS's One Meal a Day campaign is pretty simple. We're asking our community to swap one meal a day to entirely plant based. We have fresh recipes on our website daily for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's choose your own adventure for what works best for you. And, you know, small swaps can have big impacts on both your health and the planet. So one meal a day. I would also like to thank Annalise, Eats' education coordinator, for all of her efforts in putting this together. And I'll hand it back over to her to moderate. And thank you again for joining us. Great. Okay. So I know how precious everyone's time is. Um, the chat box is at the bottom of the screen, or if you're on your phone, it's at the bottom. If you tap your screen, you will see a little option that comes up that says chat. Um, the chat box, you can post in there if you have any technical issues or to share any uh, reflections. And then at the end of our session, we will have a QA and a um, about 10 minutes. We have to wrap up right at one today. So we wanna make sure um, we kind of end on time, but that is to invite you to ask questions at the webinar is going on and hopefully we can get to all of those at the end. Um, also, this will be recorded and we will share the recording with everyone who registered afterwards. It will also be on our YouTube channel, which I will also share. So that's all the housekeeping. I'm so excited to hear from our discussion today with Plant Based Utah, covering the how and why of plant-based eating. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Chandler Rosenberg of Plant Based Utah to introduce our panelists. Hi everyone, so excited to be here. Thank you Eats for having us. I'm Chandler Rosenberg, the Managing Director of Plant Based Utah, and I'm excited to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Patrick Olson, our co-founder, as well as Jessica Cooper. Um, Dr. Patrick Olson is an orthopedic surgeon at the Rosenberg Cooley Metcalf Clinic in Park City, Utah. He obtained a master's in public health and doctor of medicine degrees at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Patrick completed his orthopedic residency in Dartmouth in at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire and a master's in healthcare leadership at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. While in New York, completing a subspecialty fellowship in elbow, wrist, hand, and microsurgery at Columbia University Medical Center, he came across research on the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet and has quickly made the transition to a plant-based lifestyle. He has completed his certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. So excited to have Patrick. Jessica Cooper is a registered and certified dietitian, as well as a board certified sports dietitian. She's been personally committed and a strong advocate for consuming a whole food plant-based lifestyle for over 25 years. Jessica has held many positions from coaching clients to managing hospital nutrition services, wellness clinics, and operating a vegan restaurant. She is also a plant-powered endurance athlete. Welcome Jessica and Patrick. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Olson. Thank you so much, Chandler. Thank you, Annalise. Thank you, Megan, for having me here. And am I okay to share the screen then? You have to give me, I think, capability. So hi, Patrick Olson. I'm so grateful for the opportunity I have to speak with all of you today about a, an a area that I just love. This is pretty exciting. Um, so again, I'm going to talk to you about the why uh, whole food plant-based diet, and then Jessica is going to talk about the how. Um, so first of all, what is the ideal diet for human health? And as you can imagine, there's a lot of controversy on this. I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting there feeling very skeptical about this just because uh, people do have so many different opinions about it. Um, so what is it? Is it the ketogenic diet? Is it the Mediterranean diet? Is it, I mean, what is it? There's so many different opinions about it. So it's very controversial. Discussions can get very heated. And we really will never fully know. Um, the best study can actually never be done because you have to have a randomized control trial starting in future mothers before pregnancy. And then the baby and the child must stick to the diet throughout life. So I'm just gonna give you my opinion and my interpretation of the research pointing to the healthiest diet. And a couple disclaimers, I'm not a dietitian. I am an, a bonehead orthopedic surgeon, we call ourselves sometimes. Um, and I grew up hunting elk and deer and, and fishing for trout and salmon. So. I definitely grew up eating a lot of meat and that was my bias going into this. So the fact that I had that bias and now I've completely switched to a plant-based diet, hopefully is a little bit telling. So I just wanted to show a picture. So this is a picture of what we had for dinner on Sunday night. 
Um, so this is uh, basically on a bed of brown rice. Uh, it's like a Buddha bowl, but on a plate with a whole bunch of different veggies. It's like a teriyaki tofu with a bunch of veggies. So this is a very, uh, this is filled with a whole bunch of whole plant foods. And this is the kind of food that we talk about a whole food plant-based diet um, that, that we eat and that you can just thrive upon. Unfortunately, in America, we're all eating as if we're going to die. Um, this is the actual meal of Ted Bundy. And so Ted Bundy, before he died on death row, this is what he asked to eat. Um, he was charged, I think it was with 20 to 30 counts of murder. Um, and this is what is his last meal. And so there was actually a study that looked at this. Um, and this is a, a death row nutrition, curious conclusions of last meals. And the authors studied the final food requests of 247 individuals who were, who were executed in the United States during a five-year period. And what did they find? They found that the average last meal is caloric rich. It averaged two and a half times the daily recommended servings of protein and fat. Does that sound familiar? Which with many diets kind of focus on protein and fat. And then the most frequent request, number one is meat, is not surprising. And then fried food, desserts, and soft drinks. So unfortunately, many Americans in general are eating as if they want to die. And so I just to kind of you know, go back to this. So I, I kind of consider the meal on the left is, is a meal for the living, right? It's a bunch of living food, plant-based food. And on the right, it's a, you know, it's basically a, a dead cow. Um, so uh, it's, it's not, not a meal for living. So there's living and there's dying. And I hope that we can kind of change our framework and how we look at food as to focus more on living foods. So a definition of a plant-based diet, it promotes, a plant-based diet promotes um, the increased consumption of leafy greens, vegetables, fruits, legumes, which are like beans, and whole grains as staple foods and minimizes or eliminates animal-based products, including dairy and eggs, as well as trying to minimize or eliminate processed foods with added salt, sugar, and oil. Um, this is according to the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine, their group of physicians based out of DC, they feel like this should be the four food groups, fruits, grains, legumes, and vegetables. So those should be the four food groups. And I agree with that. That's the four food groups. But why? So why have I come to this conclusion? And why should people consider this? This is based upon population-based studies, individual-based studies, studies, specifically case control and randomized control trials. And it's the only diet to show reversal of chronic diseases. Because of time restraints, we only have time to talk about heart disease today. And even if the above evidence isn't enough, it's the best diet for the planet, which I want to share with you. So first, population-based studies. So there's this concept called Blue Zones, which many of you probably have heard. Blue Zones is a National Geographic study where they identified demographic or geographic areas of the world where people live longer and have the least health conditions or the least kind of comorbidities. And they'd identified five blue zones in the world. That's Loma Linda, California, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Sardinia, Italy, Ikaria, Greece, and Okinawa, Japan. There's th things that these communities have in common, and there's also specific aspects of these communities that are very different. Um, so when you do a Venn diagram, looking at things that they have in common, especially in these three, so there's, again, there's things that are different, you know, in Loma Linda, they have very healthy social circles. They eat a lot of nuts. In Italy, they, they do some fava beans and drink some wine. In Japan, they do a lot of turmeric, but what do they all have in common? If you look at that center, they all have a plant-based diet. Well, when we say that, what does that mean? Like how much plant-based is it? Well, if you go to the Blue Zones website and kind of look at what they found based upon these studies, is really what we should be aiming for. They should think we should be aiming for a 95% plant-based diet at least. So 95% with 5%, just very, very, very minimal animal-based products. Um, but that's really to kind of hit the, 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 the real health benefits of plant-based diet. So now let's look at one specific blue zone, Loma Linda, California. So it's the healthiest population in America. And what makes them unique? So there are also known, there's a big religious community there, also known as Seventh-day Adventists, and they're encouraged with their religion to be predominantly vegetarian. But just like any religion, people have their own different um, interpretation of it. And so they, some people eat meat, some people are vegan and all the above. So 
uh, a study looking at these. So the seven, the vegetarian diets and the Adventist health study. Um, and this is a total of over 70,000 Seventh-day Adventists. So again, this is the healthiest population in America. And they looked at over 70,000 of them. And they classified them based upon their diet. So there were some that were non-vegetarian, so they ate meat. There were some that were semi-vegetarian. They eat some meat, not as much as the non. And then there's the pesco-vegetarian that ate some fish. And then the lacto-ovo-vegetarian that ate some dairy and eggs. And then you had the vegans. So then they looked at a couple parameters, the body mass index, the diabetes percentile, the prevalence, and then hypertension. And what did they find? They found, um, it's not popping up, but they found that the, bo bo the, uh, the body mass index had a stepwise decrease of weight, the more these uh, people eliminated animal products from their diet. Diabetes, exact same thing. There was a stepwise decrease in diabetes prevalence, the more people eliminated animal products. And the same thing with hypertension, that there was a stepwise decrease of hypertension in patients who eliminated animal products. Um, uh, that's what they found in this study. So now let's talk about case control and perspective studies. And because of time, I only have time to talk about heart disease, but it's, we're, saying, we're seeing very similar findings in most medical comorbidities, including things like cancer and, um, and obesity and diabetes. But let's focus on heart disease. And why heart disease? Because heart disease is the number one cause of death globally. Uh, 17 million people die every year from heart disease around the world. That's about 50,000 people die a day. Um, so a little over seven die from coronary heart disease and another six die from stroke, which is also a type of cardiovascular disease. And it's estimated to reach 23 million by 2030. And this is according to the World Health Organization. Um, so putting this a little bit into context, there's been a lot of discussion about this pesky virus known as COVID-19, and this has been tragic, and I know, I know a lot of you have been affected by this virus. There have been a lot of deaths from COVID-19, so worldwide, there's been 2.5 million, a little over 2.5 million deaths from COVID-19, and that's of, of uh, that's of, I just checked at March 5th, and that's since January 7th of 2020, when we started having the first deaths. So on average, that's about 6,000 deaths a day. So again, how many from heart disease die a day? 50,000. How many a di a di have died a day, which have been tragically horrible from um, COVID-19 has been 6,000 a day. So you're talking a difference of eight times, about eight times uh, more deaths from heart disease and COVID-19. So if that's the case, then a real danger is not so much the virus, but these, these fast food characters, these people who are, these are the ones that are killing Americans much, much more at a much higher rate than the COVID-19 virus. So um, there is a road to um, heart disease. So heart disease, starts very early. It starts actually at birth. This, uh, according to this came out from the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine. And unfortunately, babies who are born to overweight mothers already have thickened aortas. So babies are, are right at the start of their lives, unfortunately, are on the road to heart disease when they're born from overweight mothers. And then uh, many, many toddler meals have excess sodium. And then 23%, uh, percent, unfortunately, it's a pretty high number, but 23% of two to five-year-olds are overweight or obese. Six in 10 children eat too much saturated fat, and that's by way of dairy. So there's, unfortunately, the, the, US, the USDA, who also makes our nutrition recommendations, are also uh, delegated to uh, promote meat and dairy industry. And so, as you know, a lot of the uh, school systems uh, get money um, from the from dairy and, and promote dairy. Unfortunately, the way my slides are working right now, I can't show you the rest of this, um, but nine in 10 kids uh, 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 overweight. There's actually signs of atherosclerosis as early as, uh, as 10 year olds. Um, one in three kids actually ended up uh, eating just too much uh, saturated fat and, and sodium. Uh, the second uh, highest uh, source of calories in teenagers is actually pizza. And then you kind of follow that road down. And by the time there's 18 to 20 year olds, they already have signs of atherosclerosis. And you can see how that's then leading 
to this uh, number one cause of death of cardiovascular disease. So a plant-based diet is really the only diet which has shown reversal of heart disease. And I, I can't overemphasize this. So, so again, it's the only diet that's shown reversal of our number one killer. So if it's the only diet that's shown reversal of our number one killer, then shouldn't it be our default diet until proven otherwise? And the, my argument is absolutely it should be. So until somebody can prove that there's some other diet that can reverse our number one killer, it should absolutely be our number one diet until someone can prove that the paleo diet, um, the keto diet, uh, if those things can reverse it, and, and those things can help for a short period of time in, in patients losing weight, you can actually stabilize your blood sugar, you can do all those things in a short period of time, but long, long term, the only diet that's shown to reverse it is plant-based diet. So um, a couple of studies that have shown this, so Dean Ornish actually at a UCSF, he demonstrated this way back in 1998 shown reversal of heart disease. And then another big author is Dr. Esselson at the Cleveland Clinic. He's shown a way to reverse uh, uh, heart disease. And he demonstrated this uh, quite a few years ago. This study came out in 2014. Here's right out of his paper. And this is pretty, pretty amazing. So on the, the picture on the left, this is after this is a plant-based diet after three weeks of being on a plant-based diet. Um, this is what's called a PET scan, looking at car, uh, myocardial perfusion of the heart. And on the left uh, uh, is before treatment. On the upper picture, you can see the, the red color is when you have increased blood flow. So this is before treatment. And then below is after only three weeks of a plant-based diet, look at the amount of blood flow that's gone into the heart. It's truly, truly remarkable. And then on the right, this is, a, this is an angiogram looking at the left anterior descending artery. And on the left is before treatment, you can see this is called the widow maker. This is how a lot of people die from a heart attack is when that artery gets clogged. And that's on the left. And on the right is after 32 months of following a plant-based diet, look at how much that, that artery is opened up. And so this happens throughout the body. So you'll notice a decrease in inflammation, you'll notice increased energy. Uh, if there's any men listening who have an issue with an erectile dysfunction, um, they found that erectile dysfunction actually improved as well. Because if you think about it, all those medications that treat that particular type of condition is there to help open up blood vessels. And so really what that, what that issue is, is car early stages cardiovascular disease. So if any men are, are dealing with that problem or listening right now, I encourage you to str strongly consider a plant-based diet. So the question that gets, always gets asked is, but where do you get your protein? So if we're all gonna go plant-based, where do you get your protein? So let's talk a little bit about this question. So first of all, a protein, a protein is a combination of amino acids. It's both essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. All the essential amino acids have to be obtained from our diet. Um, we don't, our bodies don't make them, but the non-essential, our bodies actually can make those. These essential amino acids do not originate from animals. So again, I, I wanna repeat that. The essential amino acids do not originate from animals. They originate from plants and microbes. The animals eat the plants and the microbes and then we eat the animals. So all essential amino acids don't originate from animals. The animal is the middleman. So um, yes, the animal and meat have the full protein chain, all the amino acids put together. Your body does have to work a little bit, a little bit harder to assimilate those amino acids into a complete protein. Um, but it's protein deficiency is extremely rare in people who just can have access to regular to, to food. So this is uh, this is from the World Health Organization, and um, uh, this is looking at estimated and recommended average requirement. So the estimated average requirement of protein is actually 0.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or about four to five percent of our total calories of protein. So, so that's really what you need is about four to five percent of your calories from pro, of, uh, for, as protein. That's not much. But then the RDA is the recommended daily requirement. And that's where they got the estimated and they added two standard deviations to encompass 99.99% of all of us. And they found that that's eight to 10% of our total calories should come from, as from protein. Eight to 10% is not very much. I mean, most Americans are like 30, 40% more of protein. And there's problems with that that we probably don't have time to go into now, but there is. And there's been studies that have shown that too much protein can actually act like a fertilizer for things like cell uh, from cancer uh, through IGF-1. 
but we don't have time to go into that. So if you look at, this is the World Health Organization, when you look at protein and plants, so if you eat 2,000 calories of these different foods, you get plenty of all of your essential amino acids, corn, brown rice, potatoes, broccoli, tomatoes, they fit basically all of your essential amino acids. So these are all the essential ones, tryptophan, phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine. So these are all the essential ones and you get it in all of those foods. Um, this is a great cartoon. I love this one because this is, a, this is a little ferret. A ferret is an obligate carnivore that only eats meat, talking to a vegetarian uh, uh, gorilla and the ferret saying, no meat at all. Are you sure you're getting enough protein? And, and really there's this weird dynamic in our brains uh, that the meat dairy industry has done a great job making us think that we can only get protein from animal products like the ferret thinks. And the ferrets, this little scrawny creature, and then you've got this uh, big gorilla that only eats meat. So think about the animals, they're very, some of the very strong animals like gorillas, rhinos, horses. I mean, where do they get their protein? They get them from the plants. This is a guy, his name is Nehemiah Delgado. He's 100% plant-based. He has actually never eaten meat in his life. So his parents were super hippie, uh, 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 they were vegetarians. So we did have a little bit of dairy uh, growing up and eggs, but he's been 100% plant plant-based. I don't know for how long, but I think most people who see him would argue that he's pretty muscular and he is not eating meat and he doesn't eat meat and he does just fine. So there is a problem with too much protein, the wrong type of protein as well. So this is just fresh off the press. This came out of the Journal of the American Heart Association, uh, February 24th of this year. And what these authors looked at, this is a, a Harvard study uh, that they looked at uh, over 100,000 postmenopausal women enrolled in the Women's Health Initiative, and they followed them through February of 2017, so almost a 20-year follow-up for this. And they looked at the association of major dietary protein sources with all-cause and cause-specific mortality. And so it's a prospective cohort study. They follow people over time. It's one of the best studies. And what did they find? They found comparing the highest with the lowest quintile, plant protein intake was inversely associated with all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, and dementia. So in other words, what they're saying is, is that the more plant protein you, you eat from plants, the lower your risk of all-cause mortality, heart disease mortality, and dementia, which is pretty remarkable to find that inverse correlation. And then they did what's called a substitution analysis. I'm trying to get my um, substitution analysis. So when you substitute animal protein with plant protein, that was associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, dementia. And when you substitute total red meat, eggs, or dairy with nuts, so get rid of the red meat, eggs, and dairy, substitute those nuts, that's what's associated with a, low, a, risk of, a lower risk of all-cause mortality. And again, this just barely came out in 2021, and, and they announced this on Good Morning America. Uh, it was a, a great, great study. So, so the question that people also ask, and this is a question I was asked before this, is should plant-based meat alternatives be avoided? Um, so I th actually think it's important to kind of focus on eating plants, not foods made in a plant. Sometimes, and I think we get so caught up in some of these alternatives and these processed meats that those aren't necessarily healthy. So this is another Harvard study, Harvard of Public Health came out in the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2017. They looked at 200,000 health, 200, health professionals for over 25 years. And they classified diets into two patterns, those who are plant-based, those who are healthy plant-based, eating more fruits and vegetables, and then unhealthy, had increased juice, sweetened beverages, uh, potato chips, those kind of things are, are plant-based also, but they're, they're not healthy, they're processed plant-based foods. And what they found is that, first of all, if you adhere to any plant-based diet, you lower your risk of heart disease by about 8%, so not too much, but still 8% is better than nothing. The benefit was much stronger for those following a healthy plant-based diet, where they de reduced the risk of, of heart disease by 25%. Those who followed the unhealthy diet pattern, there was actually a 30% increase in the risk of developing heart disease. So those who ate a lot of processed plant-based foods, you're actually more unhealthy um, than just eating some meat. So, so it's better to avoid those processed foods 
um, especially a lot of those processed um, meat products too that are not necessarily healthy because of all the sodium, all the oil, all the, all the, uh, the processed stuff. So just stick with eating more whole plant foods. Having said that, um, there, there is a lot of push in this, and I think these could be uh, okay transitional foods. This barely came out on March 6th, just four days ago from the New York Times. Um, this guy is a meat eater, um, and he said this, is the burger nearing extinction? Meat has more competition and less justification than ever before. And he's arguing for a couple of things that he's, he's noticing in, in what's happening right now. So there's some promising meat alternatives that I think I haven't, we haven't fully understood what's going to happen and their health benefits quite yet. There's cultivated meat. So these are, this is meat grown from stem cells of animals. So you actually get a little stem cell from an animal, you can cultivate meat. It's very, very expensive. So they can make, they can make a steak, you can make a chicken breast, you can make a fish. Um, uh, and it, it, you don't have to kill any animals, you don't have to kill the environment in the process, um, but it's very, very expensive. Um, and the health benefits are a little bit unclear because you're still eating the meat. And then there's fermentation derived proteins. So this is barely coming out. This is made from microorganisms like fungi, and then they can turn into a meaty or a cheesy or a creamy or a milky direction. There's a lot of promise in these fermentation derived proteins um, that seem very promising. So, so just keep that on your radar. There might be a future for some of these things. So what if I told you, because um, I only have a few more minutes, what if I told you that the, the best diet for our, our bodies is also the best diet for the planet? And, and I, I think that even if everything I told you in all these studies is just BS, let's say all this stuff, there's no truth to any of what I've told you. But uh, if, is it possible that, that if, whatever is the best diet for our bodies is also the best diet for our planet? And I think that as we know, in so many areas of life, there's this symbiotic relationship with what we put out into the world, we get back in the world. I mean, there's, it makes sense that, that, this would be, that this would be a harmonious uh, relationship, that whatever is healthiest for our bodies is also healthiest for our planet. And in my mind, there's no question that this is the truth. So even if you only do this for the environment, it's, it's a good reason to go plant-based. This came out from the, the United Nations way back in 2006, where they came out with this report called the Livestock's Long Shadow, and they looked at specifically the damaging effects of the environment um, from raising animals for food, for, uh, for food animal agriculture. Um, so the United Nations uh, came out with this report 2018. Uh, according to the United Nations Environmental Agency, quote, as humans, meat production is one of the most destructive ways in which humans leave their footprint on the planet. So again, uh, to read that again, as humans, meat production is one of the most destructive ways in which humans leave their footprint on the planet. Despite, despite this fact, the global meat industry continues to grow with the FAO predicting a 76% increase in global meat consumption by 2050, more meat will be eaten than ever before in our history. So unfortunately, the desire for meat is not being satiated. Um, and this came out from the Environmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC 2019. They argued that eat less meat, the United Nations climate, they tackle diet. They're just encouraging not to eat it. And they even looked at how much greenhouse gas, uh, uh, gases would be mitigated by eliminating animal products. This is looking at specifically gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. Um, you can save eight gigatons of CO2 emissions in a year, um, the world as a whole, by not eating any animal products. And then if you eat once a month, it goes to about six gigatons um, living meat. So definitely there's a stepwise gradient that the less animal products, the more you save by way of CO2 equivalents. But the best is just not eating animal products, period. And raising animals for food are responsible for climate change. Animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, airplanes, boats combined. There's this process of uh, raising animals for food is, is inc incredible production of greenhouse gas emissions. It's also a leading cause of the rainforest destruction. So up to 91% of the destruction of the rainforest, which is considered in some, in some people's minds, the lungs of our planet. Um, you know, all those trees, all, all that, that vegetation that's producing uh, all that oxygen and absorbing all that CO2 is being destroyed. Why? For grazing of animals, everyone's got to have their grass-fed beef, 
and it's for raising of crops to feed these animals, predominantly raising the crops to feed the animals, and we're destroying the Amazon rainforest at a huge, huge amount. It's also a leading cause of water consumption. It's responsible, raising animals for food is responsible for 55% of water consumption, whereas domestic use is only 5%. So if you've got someone who leaves the water on and their hose in their front yard, and you kind of say, gosh, that's, that's not good, they're doing that, you're much, much better off telling someone they shouldn't eat a hamburger because one hamburger is the equivalent of about two months of showering. So I, we're pretty critical of each other and how we use water, but it doesn't even come close to, to really eating animal products for food. It's also a leading cause of water pollution, including fresh water pollution. Um, all the feces from all these animals has to go somewhere. And all the fertilizers, all the antibiotics, all the things that go in raising animals for food has to go somewhere. It's, it's a leading cause of the ocean dead zones and the Great Barrier Reef die off. It's a leading cause of world hunger. Why? Because livestock consumes up to 50% of all grains. That should be going to us, not, not raising animals for food. And it uh, also occupies 45% of, uh, of uh, free land. It's a leading cause of wildlife extinction as well. So the USDA killed 2.7 million animals a, a year on average, including black bears, cougars, wolves, bobcats, foxes, coyotes. Why are they killing these animals? It's because it's to save the cattle and to save the sheep and all these animals that we're raising um, for food. This is a quote from James Cameron. James Cameron is a, uh, uh, he's a very famous director and he said this, he said, almost every major environmental problem could be solved by a global shift toward plant-based eating. And I agree with that. And then last quote from Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein said something pretty amazing a long time ago, nothing, nothing will benefit human health and increase the chances for survival on life on earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. I thought that was pretty profound because not only did he address the health, the human health, but also the health of the planet as we evolve to a vegetarian diet. And I like how he used the word evolve. We need to push forward. We need to progress. We don't want to go back in time like the paleolithic period and adopt a paleo diet. No, we need to push forward. We need to evolve. The, the future, the future is, is ahead of us uh, from a plant-based diet for sure. Based on all this, my partner, Tom Rosenberg, and I uh, formed this group called Plant-Based Utah in 2017. Um, and our mission is to improve health through sharing evidence-based information initiatives, which advocate for a whole food plant-based lifestyle. Uh, and then we're having, hopefully, a, we have a plant-based symp Utah symposium. Uh, usually every year, we couldn't this last year. Um, and usually we do it at the Park City Hospital. We had to do it at the Salt Palace one year because we just had too many people, but we like to do it here in Park City. Hopefully we'll do it this fall and we really, really hope you can all join us. So big thanks. So this is uh, my wife and these are our four kids. And yes, we do raise our four kids on a plant-based diet. You can tell they look pretty healthy. My daughter's almost my height and she had, didn't grow up on dairy. Amazing that she could grow, uh, grow on no dairy, but she's done great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Olson. Um, we can go ahead and pass it over to Jessica now. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. Perfect. I'm going to um, start my video, which is going to um, give a view of my kitchen, which I'm going to then share a few slides and I'm going to hop and meet you in my kitchen and show you some practical tips on the how of plant-based eating. Um, but first I will start my video into my kitchen. Are you able to see that the video? Yes. yes. And then now I will share my screen. And presentation mode. Okay, is my screen sharing okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Olson, for presenting the science and removing any doubt on the evidence behind a whole food plant-based diet for both human health and planetary health. I couldn't think of anyone else to follow than you. So thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to point out, um, Dr. Olson shared a little bit about Plant-Based Utah and I wanted to thank EATS for having us here today. But I really wanted to point out that we have a shared vision and this is to promote a significantly healthier generation. And as Dr. Olson pointed out, 
really looking to um, moving forward. So I'll be talking about the, the how of plant-based heating. Um, we know from behavioral science that humans can retain about three to four things. So I've broken it down into four simple things. These are um, the four P's of plant-based eating. You must love the word P because it starts, plant starts with the letter P. So these are plan, procure, prepare, and promote. We're gonna talk about each of these in more depth. One of the questions that I get asked that I wanted to set the stage with here today is, is it better to go all in or to transition slowly to whole food plant-based eating? I do think this depends a little bit on one's personality. Some people do great going cold turkey where other people um, do, and, and I hate using those, the analogies of, of dead animals. I don't even know why I said the cold turkey, but anyways, aside from that, other people do, it's a little more sustainable by making small baby steps and just picking your North star and making um, stepwise progression to that. And, and I'm going to talk about some easy tips to transition to whole food plant-based eating. So one thing I really like to encourage people to do is to start where you are. Really take a good look at what you're doing now and then look for opportunities to include whole food plant-based items into what you're already doing. Breakfast tends to be the easiest meal of the day for most people to change their habit. And that's because most people tend to stick to the same one or two breakfasts. And then it's really easy to implement a habit change when you just change one of those things. And then work towards including healthier whole food plant-based items at lunch and dinner and then making the entire transition. I also really like people to think about simple inclusionary approaches. I, for one, am someone who doesn't like to be told what not to do. Most people tend to be more successful when we tell them what they should be doing. And so I'll, I'll point out a few of those things today. I have included some resources. A question came across about where to find the recipes. Um, there's many recipes on Eats Park City and they'll be sharing more of those with the One Meal a Day campaign that they're currently promoting. The One Meal a Day for the Planet is an awesome website filled with recipes. Forks Over Knives also has recipes. If you're looking for more of the science behind plant-based eating, nutritionfacts.org by Dr. Michael Greger is an awesome resource. And then lastly, Dr. Olson shared the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine's um, Guide to Healthy Eating, their, their plate. Um, their website, it also has a lot of great information. These are some of the resources out there that you can get right now for free to get you started on this. So the one meal a day, they have a free easy download that has a shopping list, a meal plan and recipes. They also have an accountability tracker so you can track your progress on eating plant-based meals. Um, PETA has a two week vegan meal plan. It's mostly whole food plant-based. It does incorporate some of the transition foods that Dr. Olson talked about, such as the, um, the plant-based meats, but it is also free and on their website. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has a 21 day kickstart that is all on an easy to use app. They'll send you reminders. There's 21 days of recipes and a grocery list. So it doesn't get much easier than that. There's lots of free resources out there that are available for you. So I also get asked all the time, how can I ensure I'm getting adequate nutrients on a plant-based diet? And I find this to be one of the most funny questions because the reality check is that most people are overfed and undernourished on a standard American diet. We know that more than 80% of what Americans eat is processed for fast, convenient food. And in some areas, it's even much higher than that. And more than half of that is ultra-processed manufactured food. So these are things that they are putting additives, they're manufacturing the food to make you addicted to the food items. We should be outraged at the food industry of what they are doing to, to get us hooked on their food. But the majority of Americans are not meeting recommended intake levels for basic nutrients, even when you factor in fortified foods and supplements. And Dr. Olson did a great job of pointing that out. So the fact is, is that nutrient intake will greatly increase with a shift towards whole food, to, towards a whole food plant-based diet. This is an infographic from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. This isn't just a bunch of tree huggers out there saying, hey, we should all eat this way for the planet. This is a scientific organization run by healthcare professionals such as doctors and dietitians that are advocating for a whole food plant-based diet. When people ask me what their kids will be missing out on if they eat a plant-based diet, I like to tell them the things they will miss out on most is a risk for obesity, a risk for type two diabetes, a risk for heart disease, and the risk for some cancers. 
what they'll be gaining is, is health. And any movement towards a whole food plant-based diet is progress. So this is um, Dr. Frager's Daily Dozen from Nutrition Facts. There's an app where you can track um, to see your progress towards this. This is a great diagram to show how you can think about including healthy foods, not excluding. If this was the North Star of healthy eating, if you were to eat all of these things in a day in the servings he suggests, you would achieve optimal health. So I'll, I'll point these out when I hop into my kitchen. I won't go over it too much now, but I created a very simple um, in season right now shopping list. And I'll talk about that. These were things that were in my pantry and some, some preparation tips. But I, I lastly, I just want to empower everyone to promote this. We know again from behavioral science that one of the factors for long-term success is to really have a social circle that's doing this and to be an advocate. So set the example to give healthy food or non-food gifts. Really the biggest gift you can give anyone is good health. And that's for your children, your family, your loved ones, and your friends. And then to look at how you can be a part in changing your com community food culture. Um, Dr. Olson pointed out the COVID-19 pandemic. I put this up here. And, and of course, the current public health announcement is to mask up for health. This is so important to stop the spread of COVID-19. And of course, we're putting masks on our kids. You wouldn't think twice about that. But simultaneously, we're feeding our kids junk or we're consuming junk food. And so my public service announcement, in addition to masking up for health until COVID-19 ends, is to eat a whole food, plant-based diet for lasting health, longevity, and health quality. So I'm gonna hop into my kitchen. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and hop into my kitchen. So are you able to now see my, my kitchen right there? Yes, I can, it looks great. <laughs> All right, so I'm so excited. I haven't ever broadcasted live from my home, but what I did today is I, I basically pulled everything out of my pantry and my refrigerator. I, I also want to make note that these are not things that I purchased for this demonstration. These are things I keep on hand to talk about a couple healthy whole food plant-based meals that you can prepare when you stock your pantry well. So let's just walk through some of these items. Um, I've provided everyone with the shopping list and the slides. And again, this is things are, that are in season right now. This will change as we go through different seasons, but, but what is always stocked? Let's start out with some of the grains. I keep my pantry well stocked with whole grains such as quinoa, brown rice, oats, even whole grain popcorn, which my kids love as a snack. Um, I will have some packaged goods on hand, which definitely make it um, convenient when you're, when you're having friends over or preparing things for a potluck and, and when people aren't as accustomed to eating whole, whole grains. So there's some really great um, pastas made from lentils and grains out there. This is a chickpea-based pasta. There's also a red lentil-based pasta. Polenta is another whole grain that's great to keep on hand. Corn tortillas made from whole corn, great staple. I even keep um, brown rice cakes. My kids will do like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on these or a peanut butter banana snack on these. So, so these are some of the staples I keep on hand. One of the tips for increasing whole grains in your diet is to prepare them in advance. So brown rice takes a little longer to cook, um, but it cooks up really quick in a, a rice cooker. What I like to do is at the beginning of the week is to cook a big batch of brown rice. It even freezes really well. So if you don't get to eat it at all, or if you want to keep little bags frozen in your freezer, it's a great way to make sure you have those whole grains cooked and ready to go when you're in a hurry you know, after school and driving kids around or, or work projects or things like that. Quinoa is another one that I cook in advance and have on hand. So then let's move to the bean category. There's so many awesome types of beans out there that you can get. And as Dr. Olson pointed out, um, beans are one of those foods in the blue zones that they have in common. They are one of the foods associated with longevity. So these are a great thing to keep on hand in the dry form because they, they last for a really long time. They do take a, a bit of time to cook, and that's why I like to have an instant pot or a pressure cooker where you can cook those a little faster. Another tip is to choose lentils such as red lentils and brown lentils, which quick, quick, cook much faster than your traditional um, black beans or dried beans. Tofu is from the bean family, a great source 
of protein. And Dr. Olson showed us that wonderful tofu dish he had last night for dinner. And I'm going to show you some ways to include that as well. Um, edamame, just that you can steam or cook in the microwave super fast. It makes a great snack. It's one of my, my kids' daily afternoon snack is just to have some fresh edamame. People often ask me about what about canned beans? And while they're a little higher in sodium, you can buy low sodium varieties. You can also drain and rinse them to decrease the sodium content. But it's a great idea to keep your, your pantry stocked with an assortment of dried beans to make sure you have them on hand. You can pop open the can, drain them, put them on salads, um, cook, put them into soups for a quick, easy way to get beans in your diet. I'll even um, keep a few backup cans of bean-based soup in my pantry for those real emergency moments or when I'm traveling and you know don't necessarily have access to my instant pot or my kitchen and I just need to have some quick solutions. And you can even you know add more greens to these to, to boost the health properties. Now let's move to my favorite category, which is fruits and vegetables. If I was to tell people to do one thing, it's just to start consuming more fruits and vegetables. I like to keep a big fruit bowl on hand. So when my, my kids are around or when I'm around, I see that I'm an enticed to eat bananas, apples, oranges, berries. And again, this is going to change through the season. Can't wait for summer. One of my favorite fruits is watermelon. And I would have a nice large watermelon out on my, my countertop that would be enticing to eat on a hot summer day. Berries are one of um, the daily dozen that you would want to try and eat every day along with several servings of fruit. I also try and keep um, some dried fruit options on hand for maybe when my fresh fruit stock is running low. And these can be you know, raisins, dried blueberries, even having a backup supply of frozen berries is really great because these are a great addition to smoothies and then you don't have to rely on getting fresh fruits um, every single day. Right now, one of my favorite um, treats is a few slices of dried organic mango. So let's move to the veggies. Obviously, um, great to have on hand fresh greens, your cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cabbage. I want to point out this beautiful purple cabbage right here. Um, per dollar, this is one of the highest sources of an antioxidant called anthocyanin. It's a plant-based based pigment that gives us this nice purple color. Um, this lasts in the refrigerator for quite some time too, so it's not something that's super perishable. Uh, I saw in Dr. Olson's picture, he had some shaved cabbage and that. At the beginning of the week, a great way to keep vegetables prepared and handy is, is to chop some in advance. So at the beginning of the week, I'll maybe shred or chop some vegetables so that when I'm going to make a soup or have a salad or a snack, that those are readily available to me. So let's look at some nuts and seeds. Um, I keep lots of jars of different types of nuts on hand, pistachios, almonds, cashews, hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds that you can toss on a salad. You can eat these as a snack. Um, I tend to have a little handful of pistachios as an evening snack because we know they're high in melatonin, which, which helps encourage restful sleep. I'll have some nut butters on hand for my kids. Um, I'll even have some, some nut-based milk on hand that you can either purchase pre-made or make on your own. And then lastly, to complement all of this, you would want to have some spices because you want to add flavor where you can. So some of the best spices and that are on the daily dozen, turmeric, chili powder, cassia, cinnamon, um, packed with antioxidants. And then I will also keep some additional spices. I like spicy foods, so when I'm making things, I'll have some hot sauces on hand. Um, also going back to the, the vegetables, um, it's perfectly okay to keep your freezer stocked with all kinds of frozen veggies. So I've got frozen Brussels sprouts, frozen spinach, frozen corn, frozen edamame. Um, and, and this ensures that if I'm in a pinch, didn't make it to the grocery store, that I have some vegetables on hand to cook. The most important thing is, is that you're eating them every single day. Okay, so we've talked about stocking a pantry. I'm going to quickly illustrate just a couple of my favorite easy meals. Um, what I found after years and years of counseling people is that most people don't really cook from recipes on a day-to-day -day basis. They tend to cook with the recipe quiver that they have in their head. So they're, they're whipping up you know, taco night or a pasta night. They're having the same breakfast meals. So I wanna talk about a few of those that I do that are just based on some really easy ingredients that you have on hand. 
So the first one we're going to start with is breakfast. Um, this right here, I'll make these in advance in the evening. This is just a half a cup of oats, some chia seeds, some flax seeds, and I'll add to this um, a little sweetener, maybe some chopped dates, and then a half a cup of a plant-based milk. You can also add some water. You give it a good shake and you put it in your refrigerator. And in the morning, you have these lovely overnight oats. And when you make them in these little easy to go jars, you can throw on some berries, some other chopped nuts, um, a sliced banana, and, and you're good to go. You can even eat these as an easy to go meal. Okay, so one of my favorite quick and easy things to do for dinner is I was blessed with the same picky eaters as, as everyone else. So um, just because I do this a lot, my kids definitely go through food jacks. They, they both, I, I have four kids, but, but two are, are grown. My youngest two um, definitely have very different likes and dislikes. One of them loves beans, one of them loves nuts. So one thing I do is a lot of these deconstructed power bowls. Um, Dr. Olson showed his lovely Buddha bowl and I'm just gonna assemble one really fast in the last couple of minutes here. So I'll start out with a large bowl. I'll add a grain of choice. So I will add a little brown rice to this. This is a Southwestern power bowl, one of my kids' very favorite. So it's brown rice. I'll add some black beans that I actually took from a can and they're drained and rinsed. One thing I do every week is I, I bake up some sweet potatoes. My kids cannot get enough of these. Um, they're packed with carotenoids. So I'll add some sweet potatoes pair very nicely with Southwestern cuisine. I'll add some sweet potatoes. I'll add some corn, uh, maybe some fresh chopped red peppers some of my carrot cabbage slaw and some tomatoes and even maybe some avocados um, for a little healthy fat, especially for my, my very active kids. And there you have this lovely, nice Southwestern bowl packed with grains, veggies, cruciferous veggies, healthy fats. You can sprinkle on some pumpkin seeds for added nutrients. And then what I like to top it with is some salsa. My kids will actually just eat, it, eat this heated up just like this. They have a little more subtle palate. Um, another example um, similar to what Dr. Olson showed is a teriyaki version of this where I'll just do a, a rice or a quinoa with some sesame green beans, some of the purple slaw, sweet potatoes, and some grilled tofu. That makes another awesome quick meal. So what you can see here is if, if you have all these fruits and veggies chopped up, it's really easy to, to assemble as you go throughout your day. And then for to, to kind of add in some snacks, round off the daily dozen, I might have some edamame, some fresh fruit, and of course my, my little handful of pistachios at night for my, my dose of melatonin. So since we're, we're running out of time and we might want to get to a couple last questions, this is my pantry. This is my kitchen. This is how easy it is to assemble some whole food plant-based meals. Um, so I'm going to pop back over to my computer and see if there's any questions that we have. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was such a beautiful presentation. Thank you. You know, if you have any questions, though, uh, Chandler knows how to contact Jessica and I, and, and we just appreciate this time to, 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 you know, share some of these thoughts and studies with you all. And, and hopefully you can join us with Plant Based Utah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And if there's are, there are any questions, we're happy to get answers to you, get the slides um, that I've presented today with the shopping list out to you as well. Awesome. Thank you all so much. This was so wonderful. Thanks for inspiring us all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thank hey, you so thanks. much. You bet. Take care.